<laughs> all right. That, well, hey, Janae, thanks, thanks for, all, for being here. Um, I'm Brett Gibson. Uh, I'm an investor at a, a venture capital firm called Initialized Capital. And um, you know, we're going to talk about Janae and his journey um, from the startup we invested in, Athelas, to Comure, and like what we, what we can learn along the way. So maybe we can start, I, I guess, at the end, which is <laughs> what is Comure and, um, you know, maybe a little bit about, about your background. Yeah, definitely. Well, first of all, I, I want to say a big thank you because Initialized was, so we did, we did Y Combinator, Initialized was the first 200K check, and then a week later, Sequoia put in money in our seed round. And so you guys were literally there from the very, very beginning, and so we're, we're grateful for, for all that support. Um, and it's been seven, eight years now. And I guess looking at where we're at today, the business supports 40 of the top 50 health systems in the United States. We help process $5 billion worth of uh, healthcare insurance claim, volumes every, claim volume every year, um, support over a quarter of a million clinical providers, nurses, physicians, um, and basically help run 10 million appointments a year uh, uh, in, 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 in the US. And so uh, Comure at its core is a healthcare workflow automation platform, everything from clinical documentation, ambient AI, and then revenue cycle. So automating those tens of thousands of back office jobs. But we started when you guys met us in a, in a pretty uh, different and interesting space in, in diagnostics um, back when we were Othellos. And so maybe if it's helpful, maybe I can, I can just kind of start there and, and share what we look like when, when Gary and then the initialized team first took a look at us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's fascinating all the things that Camir does today. And so like getting, you know, the, the connecting the dots between where you, where you began and to where you've ended up. So, you know, what did it look like and what, you know, what was the initial product? Yeah. So I, I started my career doing research at Stanford AI, working on computer vision, natural language processing. Um, and one of the immediate application areas that's, that you know, sticks out to you is healthcare. Mm -hmm. It is the, the industry, particularly in the US, but I'd say around the world, where the ratio of work, like high output real work, to work tax, which is like really all of the admin bloat and random stuff you have to do in order to get a job done, is the worst. Like I would, I would argue that for every 10 hours of work tax and admin work, there is like maybe one unit or one hour of productivity that's generated in healthcare. And so from the, from the onset, healthcare was a really exciting place to go apply artificial intelligence. And, and it seemed like the right lever point for an engineer to spend their time. When we started, I was particularly interested in blood diagnostics. Mm -hmm. And that was using computer vision in order to automate a test called the CBC. Uh, and use a small volume of blood in order to essentially run an entire CBC or complete blood count. And it was really funny because if that sounds familiar, you know, it was 2016. <laughs> yeah. I was a Stanford There's dropout. A story about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was like literally like the Theranos Wall Street Journal yeah. article had come out the week that I met with Initialized. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think Gary actually had a guy from Theranos come and do like diligence on our company. And I remember that guy was like super skeptical of everything. I was like, this is weird. This guy seems to be dealing with some of his own internal conflict. Um, yeah. But yeah. But yeah, that's really wild. And then, and, but then that wasn't the end of the story for the products at Athela. So where did, where did you go from there? Yeah, so the, the first two years of running the company were, were brutal. Like we, we basically became experts on clinical trials, working with the FDA. We had this little device that looked, you know, looked like an Amazon Echo. Um, and I mean, we were, we were like in manufacturing hell for, for two years. We were in clinical and regulatory prison for two years, uh, just going back and forth with the FDA. I remember when we did our, our seed conversation with Initialized, I told them, we will have an FDA clearance in 90 days. And Alfred from Sequoia and, and Gary and Initialized and everyone was just like, no, you will not. And, <laughs> and, uh, and they were right. It took yeah. us 400 days, mm -hmm. uh, which was still fast. But we, we, we got the clearance. We launched this device, which really simplified immune monitoring for a special cohort of patients, cleared. It was the first device of its kind. It was actually the first ever AI-powered diagnostic for the home ever um, to be cleared by the FDA. Scaled to a couple million in revenue, uh, a couple thousand patients, 
core pharma partnerships. And, and then I think we realized like, okay, we have two options. We can sell this company as a diagnostics med device business to maybe like an Abbott or you know, Roche or someone for a good amount, good first initial exit, or we can double down and expand what the business does. Mm -hmm. And the most valuable asset we had accrued up until that point of time, I would argue is not the IP of the device or our regulatory expertise or the blood, sweat, and tears from manufacturing, it was the fact that we had a really strong understanding of what it meant to power a healthcare practice. What were their problems? What did a doctor deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that was work tax or admin bloat? So we just started building. We yeah. started adding software features for revenue cycle, for documentation, for co-pilots, and eventually built this like Rippling-esque you know, suite of tools that a doctor can run to power their practice. And would you say that it was m not just understanding all the parts of the practice, but like understanding how to get these relationships? Like how much of that, how much of it like figuring out how to sell in th these kind of places inform what you did next? So I, I would say that selling into health systems is like selling into many little departments of defense. Like it, you are dealing with, which is, which is good and bad. That's an awesome the, analogy. The, 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 good, <laughs> the, the good thing about the, the Department of Defense is you get big contracts, yeah. right? Like, we, we, like our, we just announced this large partnership with HCA, which is a massive $100 billion empire in the U.S., runs large percentage of hospitals. Huge deal for the company. Uh, but it took like a year and a half, maybe two years, in order to formulate that whole thing. And so w when it comes to go-to-market and health systems, you have to be ready for the large onslaught and the time that it takes to get anything done. But understand that there is a big reward at the end of the road. My recommendation to startups is selling into health systems from the get-go is actually a very bad idea. Mm -hmm. And where we found initial success was selling into smaller practices, clinics where you have a fast decision maker, you have real pains every single day, and you can go sign a $20,000, $30,000 contract that week if, you're, you know, if your product solves a problem for them, um, versus not getting any signal for quarters, in some cases years, with those large contracts. And, and, and that's how we stacked it. We started in private practice, and then it worked our way up into large health systems. And then when you were thinking through, I, I, you know, like where to go next, I mean, like a lot of it's obviously just talking to the customer and their needs, but um, it sounds like something of a theme that's going to come out is like, there, once you have these relationships, the expansion path is very important. I, I, I think the, 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 the most valuable thing any company has is its relationship with its customers. Yeah. Our, we have customers from 2017 that started using us as a, as a single medical device. Like they know us as those weird kids that emerged with something that kind of looked like a bomb like, and came to their practice and tried to sell it to them to now this enterprise software company that runs billing and practice management for them. Yeah. And really they were betting on the slope of the, of the founders and, and, and in the same way that our investors bet on us and bet on our ability to go build interesting products for those customers, those customers were betting on us to solve their problems because they had a lot of problems. And I think that first cohort of 10 customers or 20 customers, if you can make them into true believers that want to see your company succeed as much as you do, I mean, you have, you have full permission to go build whatever they need. And that's yeah. what it looked like for us. We did one device, one diagnostic. I you know, solved the problem for maybe 1% of their patients. And then that earned us the right to go do more and more and eventually touch 100% share of wallet in, in, in a practice in the form of revenue cycle. And how, how did you think about like brand positioning as you you know as you walked that line? Because you know the, the, the customers are thinking about you and going to you for the, something lives in their head about yeah. like what you deliver. And yeah. so if your what you deliver is like whatever they need, that might be too broad or confusing. And like you know how how did you make it clear to people what to come to you for? I, I think you have to start super specific. Yeah. So for us, we would come in and literally the pitch was. There is a test you run every day, and it is a venous blood draw, yeah. and now it is a finger prick. And that's awesome, right? Now, was it a great business? It was a pretty good business. It wasn't a multi-billion dollar business, but it was yeah. something that you could scale to the tens of millions of dollars. But it was specific enough that it got our foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And I think it's better to solve a small, specific problem for a customer than it is to you know, claim to solve 100 generic problems. And so we, we got our foot in the door that way. And then once you're on the ground, I mean, we, Deepka, my co-founder, Dhruv, our, our, our co-founder and CTO, would literally sit in the practices. They had a better understanding of when the doctor was taking his or her lunch break, you know, what, 
what were those 40 clicks they were doing in their EHR in order to get from one page to another? Yeah. What were the problems their patients were seeing when they were paying a bill? And all of that came together in this story so that when we fed it back to them, it really touched their key pains. Yeah. It doesn't happen unless you have that first unlock and that kind of first specific solve. So it was less about like thinking through like specific adjacencies and like where you lived in the customer head and more just we have the relationship and we have the leverage to know what they need and they're going to listen to us because we've already delivered on a product that works. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And then... Um, and then, so how did you transition from practices and like at what point in the journey were you starting to look at, you know, bigger healthcare systems? I, I think we, when you walk into a healthcare practice of any kind, whether it's in the States or otherwise, there's like a hundred problems you see, right? Like the, the entire system is pretty broken. Uh, and I think any good story has a really, really good like villain. And for our hospitals and for our providers, that villain is insurance companies. Mm -hmm. When you work a, you know, a 20 hour shift and at the end of it, 30% of those, those claims get denied. That's a pretty good villain. Like that, that's yeah. someone that we're like, we want to come after. And so for us very early on, it became clear that the villain in this story is the insurance company. And, and it's funny to say that because we also have many great insurance partners and customers mm -hmm. and whatnot. But you know, for, for the sake of simplicity, insurance company is bad guy, doctor is good guy. Let's go build tools, almost like arming them with weapons to go after that bad guy. And, and, and when that became clear, who the good guy and who the bad guy in our story was, it was just kind of got, got started building from there. Um, and then M&A played a pretty big role in our story as well. We, we, you know, we've done, in, in Camura Athelis' history now, we've done probably 15 key pieces of M&A mm -hmm. over the years. One big merger between Athelis and Camura. Yeah. Uh, and then a recent take private deal where we uh, took a publicly listed company, Augmetics, on, on NASDAQ, took it private, made it part of the business, unlocked a lot of their distribution. So that, that's another way that we've expanded as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I wanted to get into that. So like, so maybe like where, where did the, how did the Khmer deal come about? Like how, you know, how was that even on your radar? Was that something you were thinking about? Or like, maybe tell us that story. Yeah, I think maybe first, like my broad thesis on m and it is highly underutilized today in, in, by startups, by uh, even like venture capital firms. Like if you study the great businesses of all time, uh, and, and, and to some extent, like even beyond businesses, like the great empires of all time, mm -hmm. right? The like going back to Alexander the Great time, like when he conquered Egypt, that was kind of like a, a, a an act of great M and A. There was not one you know shot fired. There was not one person killed in that in that battle. Similarly, like the greatest business in American history, um, that probably the Standard Oil, Rockefeller's business was built on the back of great M&A. General Electric, which electrified the entire American grid, it's like 100, 150 pieces of M&A that came together. Um, and they built refrigerators and stovetops and the, you know, the actual grid. Mm -hmm. And so for, for me, I, I always knew that M&A is a way to get from point A to point B really quickly. And if you have an organic th growth thesis behind that M&A, nine times out of 10, someone else is just too lazy to do it. Because every company has skeletons. When you take yeah. over a new business, you're dealing with their angry customers, their angry investors, their angry employees, and there's like pain when you take that on. So with, with Comure, it was interesting because Comure had, I think, amazing upmarket partnerships and great health system relationships. HC was on the board. HC is the you know, largest hospital operator in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and what we brought to the table was a very fast-moving product and engineering team. And... I think for me, I realized we had two options again. In, in some ways, we could stay focused on the small SMB mid-market, keep growing from there, and probably build a meaningfully sized business, or we could take another big swing and go after the largest hospitals in the country, which is where a lot of consolidation is happening, uh, and it's also where 60% of all care is rendered. And so if you want to be a serious, you know, eventually standard oil-style business, you, you, you need to be playing in that, in that segment of the market. So, and, and General Catalyst were you know, on the boards of both companies. Yeah. Himan's our executive chair. He's been an amazing partner. He, he kind of helped put this whole thing together. Yeah. And was it like, was it, did, they, did he bring it to you? Or like, you know, like, how did it actually, like, was it in the back of your mind? Like, yeah. I don't know, how does one think through that kind of big swing? So when your Camura was, at the time, Athelos was valued at 1.5 billion. Camura was valued at like 2.5, 3 billion, something like that. When you're bringing together two 
multi-billion dollar companies, yeah. there's like hundreds of questions. Who's going to be CEO? Whose team is going to take over? Who, you know, like what sport composition is going to look like? And most times things fall apart because of those details. Mm -hmm. in, in this case, I think we were very clear on what the end state needed to look like. We needed the Athelis management team, the Athelis engineering, the Athelis, you know, really the, the, the culture and leadership at the helm in charge yeah. of the situation. And Kamur's customer relationships with health systems, their board relationships, and their capital. That, that, was, that was kind of how we knew what we wanted from it. Yeah. Uh, I think version one of the deal, you know, we, we noodled on some numbers, didn't come to the right place. And then six months later, later we both knew this was like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And we put it together at, at the right price. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And then, I guess, in that case, it seems like there was already a lot of connectivity and, like, you know, it was kind of obvious to both sides, like, what the end state, what the right end state was. And yeah. so, you know, it was just a matter of working on it and figuring it out. Um, but then after the merger, you, you know, you're still running probably an M&A strategy. So, like, how did you, was it, is it a different motion thinking about from, from scratch? I, I think the, the thing you, you realize very quickly about M&A is... You, you need to know, when you buy a company, you need to be very explicit about why you're doing it. Yeah. And for us, most of the time, it comes down to distribution. There's a lot of legacy distribution, legacy mm -hmm. customer relationships in healthcare that are hard to supplant. If you have a contract with a large hospital, you've probably, you know, you've, you've, you've found your way in that contract after like 10 years of work. Now, I can go with a sales force and a sales team and try to figure out how to, you know, recreate that relationship, or I can come up with a fair price and buy you out and make that part of the machine. Yeah. And, and so we, we have a small, a surprising, for the amount of M&A that we do, like we, this year we probably did eight pieces of M&A. For the amount of M&A that we do, we have a surprisingly small deal team. It's, mm -hmm. it's like four people. And you know, we can quickly, it, when, you read, when you read about how Warren Buffett assesses and then buys companies or you know, in, takes large positions in companies, it comes down to the basics. Like, are they, do they have happy customers? Are the customers retaining? Um, is there some sense of, can we bring our products to their customers or can we bring, you know, or vice versa? Like, do they have a product or two that our customer base could really benefit from? And then the replatforming re re and bundling thesis. Like, can you put these, a couple of these things together in ways that reduces price for the customer and improves experience? And, and, th and that's about it. Like, if those things make sense and you can come to a good price, you should probably do the M&A yeah. and, and, and not overthink it. Really, and when, are, are there things you, you you worry about that are like like outside? I mean, because oftentimes you know you hear like just the 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 functional merging of the companies and how it affects the people is a risk point. Is that not something you think a lot about? It's a huge risk point, yeah. and 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 I think the it, it's it's one of the things you have to diligence in terms of can you can you keep the right people. And you have to work with the assumption that a lot of the people are going to leave or yeah. just aren't going to be a fit in the, in, the, in the final org. And are the right people who have relationships with customers, building product, excited about you know, the, the, the end, state, uh, end state mission of the business, are they excited and, and can we incentivize them enough to stay and, and continue building? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when we inherit and bring on those companies, they actually feel unshackled because they can go back to the basics. Yeah. Especially you know, when, you, when you take private a public company, like, if you're a public company, there's so much bullshit you're doing. Like, you're, like, doing investor readouts. And, like, there's, like, 100 people trying to short sell you every day. Just the minute we killed all that noise for, on, on Augmetics, I think the entire company became, like, three times more productive on, yeah. on the backs of that alone. And, and so there's, there's a lot of, I, I would say, acceleration when you simplify. And, and that's, that's part of what we like to do uh, during m and yeah, that's really interesting. And it's, uh, do you feel like the M and A strategy and sort of your take on the market broadly in healthcare and and owning the customer relationship and then being able to layer on you know what they need like it, it like feels heavily informed by the you know pre merger Athelis and like what you learned in those days. One hundred percent. I think if if you're just out there kind of blindly amassing assets, you will fail. Yeah. And and the the, it, the thesis that it comes from is the time that we've spent in practice. We know, like, we know what a doctor needs in order to get their job done. Mm -hmm. We know what a doctor does not care even a little bit about. Uh, and, and more importantly, I think we have a very strong, and it took eight years to develop this, a very strong understanding of what does the cash flow and P&L of our customer look like. I think yeah. for any business in software or just any business in general, you want to have a really deep understanding of your customer's P&L. Because if you understand your customer's 
flow of cash, you understand their incentives and you understand their pain points. And, and so our M&A thesis is driven by the fact that most health systems are operating at single digit you know, operating margin. Most health systems are facing massive labor shortages while at the same time having these, this insane increase mm -hmm. in, in denials and an and, and increase in labor price um, that makes it harder and harder to do business. So the only answer to that is automation. You need to apply language models to go take tasks that a human is sitting around on a computer, turn those into software. And, and most of our m and is, is, is driven by that. And, and I guess I'm struck by your, like the discrepancy of your day-to-day -day life, right? You, you're used to just doing kind of the, no. otherwise he advised, just go talk to users and do what they want. And now, you know, how, how much of your time is spent on a higher level, you know, corp dev strategy? I, I would say that uh, a, a surprisingly large part of my time is still spent in like, not in a doctor's office anymore, but in a health system, you know, in, in, with the C-suite, trying yeah. to understand like, how are you thinking about the five, next five years of your business? Mm -hmm. And what parts of our platform and products are gonna help inform the margin expansion, expansion thesis for the largest hospitals in America? So it's, it's the same, you know, sit in a doctor's office and look at their pains, but just amplified, I think, at a, at a much larger operational scale. Yeah. And more importantly, I think it's, it's can we build that, that rigor, that operational rigor and th 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 those instincts for all of the people in our business? I don't want my salespeople to be making phone calls and saying, I have an ambient documentation solution for you or I have a revenue cycle solution for you. I want them understanding the pains of the doctor. Like, where is the practice broken? Yeah. And like, which part of our portfolio of solutions can go make your practice better? Uh, and, and, and I think when we started, so much of my time was was in the lab with a pipette with, you know, uh, writing code. And Gary and, and I remember a bunch of the Initialize team came out and visited us in our, in our little garage outfit where we built the first devices. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the culture is the same, which is like be super in the weeds on these types of problems. It's, the scale has dramatically changed in, in terms of the, the types of customers and types of problems we're solving. Yeah, that's interesting because it's, there's, there's this part to it of like understanding how to execute these transactions and where the risk is. But then, uh, you know, done right, you also need to understand the high-level vision of like how do we create a platform and more so talk to technology to tie everything together in an elegant way. One hundred percent. And I think so much of company building, though, like if like, as an engineer, like most problems can be solved looking at them like a some sort of a computer science problem. Like there, yeah. there's rate limiting bottlenecks, and there's you know. The, weird you know, bugs and edge cases that you have to handle for in the org and with your customer. And so it, there's a lot of first principle scaling and like we got punched in the face a lot like over yeah. the eight years. Like when you run a company for eight years, you spend most of the time not being the hot company on the block. Like after we did our seed round, it's like Sequoia, Initialized, all, you know, Y Combinator, everyone thought we were like the hot company on the block. Yeah. And that lasts for three months. And then after that, no one cares about you and everyone's <laughs> like, oh, well, they have no revenue. Like, and then everyone's talking about how you're yeah. not the hot company because that's the cool thing to do now. Yeah. And you just have to ignore that and understand that it is an eight-year journey and what TechCrunch or Business Insider write is entirely irrelevant because they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, it's like, it's like the prize for a successful fundraiser is you get to go prove it again. Yes, each, each exactly, One, 100%. Yeah. yeah. So, it, so for a founder that, you know, if, if a founder is able to get to the stage where they, you know, start want to start doing an M&A strategy, was it, did you have to approach it as a new skill? You know, did it feel very different or was it like a kind of a natural progression relative to what you've done before? I think it is, it's, it's a unique skill because you are, it's, it's like the biggest enterprise sale, right? Yeah. And, you're, and you have multiple stakeholders. You have to make sure that the, the, the other side CEO and investors are bought into it. You have to, first of all, you have to convince yourself that it's a, this, with high conviction, this is something you want to do because yeah. once you're in, you're in. Um, and then you have to go sell everyone in the org. Yeah. And you have to build a system to consistently sell them yeah. and make them believe in this you know, combined thesis. Because there's like a transaction and then a leadership challenge because then you're going to be everyone's leader. 100%. Yeah. And I think the only way to do it well is to be highly opinionated. If you come in trying to appease everyone, you will lose. You will yeah. die. The, the transaction will completely fail. You have to have a very clear framework. This is how we run things. This is the culture of the new business. This is what we're trying to accomplish. And if you're in, you're like deeply in. You will, you will make more money here than you would have at the last company by a factor of 10. Yeah. If you're not in, let's make that decision very quickly. And, and so it's an it's a, it's a opinionated kind of 
high-pass filter sales process. And if, if you do it well, um, it concentrates talent and it, it creates more focus. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I, I guess you know, <laughs> that's passed quicker than I expected because it's kind of a fascinating topic for me. But um, you know, as we're out of time, what's next for Camir? What, what should we be looking forward to? Yeah, I think for me, the, the healthcare market is massive. Obviously, in the U.S., everyone knows the numbers, like $4 trillion. It's 15% of U.S. labor. It's a massive chunk of, of the you know, just overall federal line item budget. And so we're headed towards crisis as it stands. Yeah. And the only way you fix it is technology. And so for me, how can we build those tools for doctors? Because they're really the, the, the builders and the workers of the healthcare system, doctors and, and nurses and, and really all cl clinical staff so that they can go fight insurance and they can go fight bullshit denials and all this stuff that makes their job harder. Yeah. Um, and I guess just 10 more years of doing that. Yeah, well, yeah. that's awesome. Well, thanks a lot for spending the time. Thank you. It's great. Appreciate it.